The only thing that's totally real might be the present moment. Mm -hmm. The future is something that we imagine, but we've never actually seen it. And the past is a memory, which is actually a lot like the future. So I think that the present moment and the past might exist in something like a probability function of the present. And so, uh, you know, that's a far out idea. Yeah. Um, but all you really need for any reality is consistent histories and probable futures, right? So consistent histories and probable futures means that the, from the, the, the quote unquote past might be changeable to line up with the present. And the future might not be what you expect, but it probably won't be too different than what you expect. And when you're, when you're looking at an isolated consciousness effect on purely unpredictable, unobserved data, where do you draw the line as to where the influence is? Is it just the guy at the table yeah. affecting the machine or is it the millions of people who hear about this, you know, this crazy test? Right. Um, and that's really the way to look at it. And that's, that's the, uh, that's the lesson there. Welcome to Far Out with Faust, everybody. I am Faust Chicho, and today I am very excited, delighted, and honored to be joined by the one and only Adam Curry. Let me tell you about this incredible man and what he has been up to. Adam, in case you don't know, is a consciousness researcher and a technology executive, a bit of an entrepreneur, and he's focused on AI and embedded systems. He was part of the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, exploring the connection between mind and matter. He's also creator of Entangled, and that's a large-scale global consciousness research project using mobile phones. He was the recipient of the MIT Series Connection Prize at 17 for an invention that converted electro-gravitational phenomenon into signals that can help forecast seismic events, such as earthquakes. He's been featured in the Discovery Channel's Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman in the Huffington Post on many Gaia shows and many documentaries that you've probably seen, especially if you follow me and my podcast and everything I'm always ranting about. Um, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to have him. Adam, thank you so much for beaming in, brother. Yeah, I'm glad this worked out. Happy to be here. Absolutely. You know, um, I was watching some of your episodes and one of the latest ones you did was with uh, my buddy, Alan Green. That was incredible. Oh, awesome. I'm so glad you caught that. Yeah. Um, that was probably one of the better podcasts I've watched on any podcast show. Amazing. It was so good. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. That one has kind of gone under the radar um, because we were supposed to talk about Shakespeare and we got to mm -hmm. Shakespeare, but Adam was telling me that incredible story of which is about, you know, affecting matter. Yeah. You know, with intention. I mean, I, that's why I liked it. It's, yeah. it's his personal story, which is an incredible story of manifestation and, and faith and perseverance. Yeah. He's, he's probably the real life most interesting man. Yeah, he's he is phenomenal. He's literally phenomenal. He's mind blowing. Yeah, um, I actually met him in the context of, of Shakespeare because one of the sort of random things that I did um, many years ago was working on the Shakespeare, Shakespeare authorship question. Oh, really? Yeah, and Alan had approached it from the point of view of um, <clears throat> looking for codes mm -hmm. that was revealing the author. And I had got involved because there was a, a gentleman, um, a astrophysics professor actually at Stanford named Peter Sturek who had become interested in the authorship question but was approaching it through a totally different way. And um, he asked for some help on that. So we sort of collaborated. Yeah. And the funny thing is that both of us came to the same person as the real author, which is not the person that's usually indicated as the author, but we, we both had independently uh, arrived at the same person. The one that's usually indicated is what's his name, Francis right? Francis Bacon. Yeah, Francis yeah. Bacon. And I, I think it's it's Edward Devere. That's and that's who Alan thinks it's yep. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everyone's like, it's Francis Bacon, dude. Every, all the conspiracy theorists know that. I was like, um, I don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so uh, Adam and I just realized that we were born on the same day. That's our. There's incredible coincidence. <laughs> um, among other things we have. My, my condolences. Yeah. <laughs> we were born under a bad sign. Um, but um, 
you know, my, many of you who have been listening to me for a while have heard me go on about, you know, my foray into this more spiritual journey began with Dr. Joe Dispenza and, you know, making your mind matter was an ongoing and is an ongoing mantra and theme of his, him and his work. And so, so, you know, when I first started to, you know, commit to this lifestyle, it, I was always doing ex experiments and trying to see what, you know, what would manifest itself. Um, of course, you got to get your shit together before you manifest things. So it, it took a while before, you know, um, I started to see the results that I, that I was, you know, or I, I should say receive the results because sometimes you get results and you can't really ever imagine how they're going to show up. And that's another key to it. But, um, you work on this, my friend, it, it, you know, in a laboratory with instruments and technology, and you've dedicated your life to this and you're passionate about it and excited by it. And, you know, you've already created devices which do things that, um, on this planet anyway, have not really been done before. You know, I mean, maybe in the imagination, but so I, I am very excited to talk to you about some of the work you've been doing. Um, like <laughs> um, the work at Paralab and this, I mean, I, we're going to get into the lamp, that your mind lamp and, oh. and some of your more recent, recent toys. And, yeah. and it's fascinating to me that, you know, on, on the way here, you told me that 95% of what you try to invent, you know, ends up being something, you know, ridiculous or impossible, mm -hmm. but 5%. And, and like, that's a ratio I think people should understand when they're, wh whatever you're attempting to do, you know, people tend to get discouraged the moment things don't, you know, have a dreamy result. And, for, you know, play and persistence is, is, is the key mm -hmm. to every endeavor it's, and not being so result oriented. So I just think it's fascinating that, that it was a wonderful admission that you had and I think people can learn from it so I wanted to point it out you know if you're if you're going keep going don't give up because you know things have not worked out exactly not only that but when it comes to sort of ideas and you have many and you have to pick which one to pursue the ones that you think you should do because it's a better fit for society or whatever are the ones that you're going to have the most difficulty with in my experience the ones that you want to do for yourself because you think it's fun and ridiculous and hilarious and interesting <clears throat> that you have a, a better sort of emotional um, bubble around yeah those are the things that work and um, following those you end up tapping into the synchronicities that can make it happen for you because I think you're in the you're sort of in the right emotional space for you know making stuff happen. Yeah, if, it's, if it's really what you want to do. Yeah, and you love it, and you're excited by it. Right. And then that excitement is contagious. That's like you know, I don't know if you know who Daryl Anka is. He he channels Bashar. Oh, okay. Um, and Bashar is always giving everyone this formula, which really fucking works. It's his great one of his greatest gifts to this planet is this formula that he says came from this civilization of people that is trying to help us understand ourselves and this planet and how things work and the it's a formula that you know we fo follow your highest excitement whatever it is mm. follow it until you can no longer you know follow it and and then choose what the next thing is but follow it with no attachment to the results mm -hmm. you know do it as long as you're excited by it and happy doing it oh i love that you know and and let by letting go of the results you allow the universe to surprise you with whatever it's going to create for you you know and oh that's that's so true um tim ferris made a similar point in one of his books he said everyone's trying to be happy <clears throat> so they're following happiness but that's misguided because happiness is going to go up and down regardless of what you do he says the better thing um, in his experience is to follow excitement yeah um, and excitement we have a healthier relationship towards i think than happiness uh we know that excitement is is temporary and you got it for a little while and then you get excited about something else. Yeah. A happiness, it's like we want to like keep White it. White knuckle it. Yeah. We want to keep it. And it just, it resists that, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's, that's completely right. Follow what excites you. Follow your highest excitement. Yeah. And then you realize people are like, oh man, I, I, I want one of those. You're like, you just can't believe it. Like I thought I was the only one who would ever want one of these, you know, and then people get excited about it. So <laughs> it's amazing. 
Uh, we have so many things to talk about. I'm trying to figure out the best place to start, my friend. You know, you this notion that consciousness can affect physical matter in this hypnotized society we live in of materialism um, and, you know, if you can't see it or show it somebody, it, it doesn't exist. This concept is still attempting to permeate, you know, society in a way that would change our understanding. And, and sadly, <laughs> I don't know how many people will be listening to this who are in that camp because the algorithms tend to show them more of what they want, but it's still kind of foreign, right? Now, for someone like me, not only do I know the science, some of the science behind it, not like you do, but I've experienced it. And experience is a, a great teacher. Um, when you experience something, it's hard to convince someone otherwise, right? Talk to me a little bit about, about the science of how consciousness affects, how it can affect physical matter for, for people who are already going to be like, they're, whatever they're talking about, it's, it can't be true. Because <laughs> they're thinking telekinesis and they're thinking very, you know. They're thinking spoon bending. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned that the idea hasn't really permeated society. And I think that the, the science that does exist investigating mind matter, matter interaction hasn't really permeated the society. But the idea that our thoughts affect the world is uh, probably shared by the majority of people. True. So on, you know, in, in one version you have, let's say, very religious people who will pray and they're not praying thinking that it's not going to work. They're praying for some sort of outcome in the physical world. It's just that they believe that it's, um, it's not them that's doing it, right? <clears throat> and then on the other side of the spectrum, you might have the spiritual community who are interested in manifestation mm -hmm. and uh, they will uh, put their intentions out there and uh, attempt to manifest things. And they're not doing that because they think it doesn't work. Right. And then maybe, like, if I could hazard a guess, you uh, in the totally secular material side, you've sort of got um, this question of the measurement problem in, in quantum mechanics. Is it what collapses the wave function? Mm. Is it the observer, which is sort of like glib code for consciousness, or is it some process of the of the, right. of the measurement itself? And you know, people fall on different sides of that um, of that argument. There's different interpretations, but um, so all of that is like broadly in the category of mind affecting matter. Yeah. <clears throat> and so you'd say, okay, well, is there any, is there any evidence that like, specific evidence that could be elucidated that could show that mind is in fact affecting matter? And this is a question that's been picked up by many different laboratories, uh, and continues to be, to be studied. And I can tell you the story of the one that I know best, sure. which is the pair lab. And um, this is going to set the stage, I think, for understanding a lot of what, what's to come in the, in the conversation. Okay. So in um, the late 70s, there was a gentleman named Robert John, and he had become the dean of the engineering school at Princeton University. He had a, a very stellar career. He had uh, become the father of plasma propulsion and it had ascended to the highest heights of the... Uh, university system. Academia, yeah. yeah. And I think he became dean in his 40s, you know, just an incredibly accomplished man. And he had a graduate student come to him one day saying, hey, I've heard that there are these anomalies showing up in um, aerospace companies related to the pilots, um, the pilots interaction with um, their craft. Uh, so, the McDonnell Douglas Corporation was investigating things like uh, psychokinesis and mm -hmm. could could in, could um, could intense experiences such as those experienced by pilots actually affect the equipment. Mm. And so uh, there was there was one investigator who they hired. Um, he was another scientist to look at this, and he created a, a random event generator, something that converted unpredictable physical phenomena, I th in this case, I think it was radioactive decay hmm. into a series of ones and zeros, and then had people try to influence the, the outcome of that just to see if there's any um, influence there yeah. that could explain this these anomalies with the aircraft. And he found that it was happening and they couldn't explain it. There's no reason that we know of uh, why 
our thoughts could affect the outcome of these physical systems. And yet here it is happening. And so she, this, this graduate student heard about this and came to, came to Dean John and said, hey, I'd like to do this. Um, it's controversial that he said, well, I think that it involves a good experiment, right? Mm. You can build this device and uh, you can do an experiment and it's, it's, it's a good project. And you know, he had no reason to think that it yeah. would be possible. So she replicated this under his supervision and then got some people to come and attempt to influence it. And lo and behold, they're getting statistically significant results. They were, they were getting, they were showing that the one favored had a measurably significant, um, you know, above average than the one not favored. You can, yeah, exactly. So you can think of this device as a quantum coin flipper. Hmm. It doesn't have to be quantum, but it's if it's quantum, it's purely random, right? Right. So this coin flipper is is uh, producing heads and tails at a really fast pace, and those heads and tails are just representations of quantum events, something physical, right? Right. Not not pre-programmed, but something physical. An outcome. An yeah. outcome. Yeah. And so uh, you've got uh, every bit that's produced, one or zero, is independent of the one that came before. So if you take enough of these bits should be about 50 it's 50 50 right right and indeed you can do a baseline run a bunch of these bits um analyze them statistically it's very easy yeah 50 50 everything is normal in the universe right right <clears throat> um you you would expect to get some deviation uh but only sometimes right so and now over time it would and over time it comes it, right it follows the mean so now uh, what you introduce is the experimental variable. In this case, it's a person intending to make the heads. device produce more heads, heads or more tails, right? Yeah. And so they pre-state their intention. They say, okay, now for the next uh, X period of flips, I'm going to try to make the outcome be overall, overall heads, overall ones. Right. And so uh, that's all the instructions. So some people will like, uh, you know, Try to try to force it somehow, yeah. like strain, <laughs> like yeah, like hey, bend, <laughs> and um, and others will will just sort of allow it to like they people are allowed to come up with their own right sure approach to this. Um, there was no instruction there, and <clears throat> sure enough, not not every time, of course. Um, some people are are good at it. Some people are consistently good at it. Yeah, um, and others get no effects, right, or effects that are. Um, but you can you can account for that in the statistics. Point is that the 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 outcome of these will deviate in the direction of the person's intention in some statistically significant way. And you do this enough times with enough people, and you get actually really compelling results. Right. So, um, so uh, Bob John at at Princeton said, you know. We might be something. We might be onto something here. If if you're him, and you have achieved the highest heights of of engineering academia, like accomplishment, plasma lasers, plasma and, lasers, yeah. and all this stuff, you're thinking about, and you're and you're confronted with this. You're thinking about what can we learn at at the deepest level about man's interaction with the physical world. That's what engineering is. It's yeah. something that is an idea that happens in your mind and it's, and it's built and manifest in, in, in the built environment in the physical world. And here is this rarefied, fundamental example of what might be going on. So of course he's fascinated, right? And yeah. if, if this if, continues to be true, then you've learned something about the nature of reality and the nature of consciousness that is quite surprising. Yeah. At least to the standard model of how we think things should work. So he creates this laboratory and uh, gets funding and he staffs it with, um, you know, PhD rocket scientists and all these people. And um, for the next uh, 25 years, pretty much, they do a series of random number generator experiments yeah. in which they bring thousands and thousands of people in and they create different types of random number generators um, and publish the results. And uh, the... The reception among the the general population is very positive because it's exciting. Uh, back then, <laughs> yeah, it would be different today. But back then, it was very, very controversial in the academic world, and you were supposed to 
you were supposed to um, not look at what Dr. John was doing. Uh, even though privately, all of these other scientists were like, oh, this is so cool, I think you should keep going. Like publicly, they either distanced themselves from it or like, it was a different world. Like, you, yeah. you, you, didn't, you didn't say the consciousness word back then. <clears throat> and anyway, so the, the laboratory kind of had done what it was gonna do. And uh, Bob was 70, almost 80, something like that, and decided to retire. I had uh, become involved I was a teenager, but I came involved with, with them. And uh, I met them at a conference and uh, became an intern and started spending my summers there nice. and helping with, helping with research um, and kind of just learning the ropes about consciousness and embedded systems and um, how science is actually done and you know the controversies and the whole like believer skeptic thing. Yeah. Uh, that, that's how I got involved. But um, <clears throat> okay, so you originally asked me something about how does this happen? Yeah. Well, the thing is that we don't know. I don't think anybody knows. It's definitely clear by this point, given just decades of published studies, that our consciousness is affecting the physical world in some way that the random number generators can measure. And there's other classes of experiments that are showing the same. Mm -hmm. At this point, for any serious person who has actually looked at the evidence, the question isn't, is this real? It's what is the mechanism to explain yeah. how this is happening? And that's a really difficult thing to answer because you, you can't so easily just crowbar that into the existing standard model, the existing um, predominant scientific theory about how things work. It, it ain't that easy because um, consciousness itself, let alone this whole like random number generator stuff is a huge mystery. And um, you kind of got to, you might have to explain that one before you explain the rent. And I think probably the, the answer is something like that. You're not going to explain so easily the, the influence of consciousness on, on random physical phenomena using existing theories of consciousness. Right. Um, the, the only way that you could do that is to try to say that um, it's, it's quantum. Oh, it's quantum, you guys. Uh, and it's, it's a... It's my criticism of maybe the the spiritual world, but it's a bit hand wavy. Yeah, you know, I'll say you can't just say, "Oh, because quantum mechanics has some mysteries, and this phenomena has some mysteries." We and can combine the we're two, all connected. and we're all. It's like, <laughs> well, okay, but um, and I think that's brought mostly criticism yeah. on on the research, which I understand. It's probably more like this: we're going to have to think differently, fundamentally, about the nature of consciousness itself, and when we come to a new first principle about what that is. That will recover the the uh, anomalous experiments done at the the Pear Lab and elsewhere. Yeah. We'll we'll find a way to explain that that doesn't involve sort of tr trying to make quantum work right as an explanation. Trying to fit a round peg in a square hole. I mean, the way I always thought of it, in the simplest terms, and I, is that our interaction and interface with this reality is in essence besides being quantum <laughs> electromagnetic mm. and whether you're talking about a device or 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 a roulette wheel you know there's there are electromagnetic um properties always at play and and then this is where you have to take a leap you know if if you believe that you you are What's the word? Um, gifted with a an intelligence that comes from a a universal power or aspect that is greater than yourself, and that you that is what is making your heart beat and the fifty trillion cells in your body do all this incredible miraculous things every second of every day while you're on this planet then that is the thing that enables you to affect mm -hmm. in the way that you were affected when you came into this life. Mm -hmm. So you, yeah, you have, to, you have to find a way to marry a kind of a spiritual understanding with, mm -hmm. with a physical understanding. And our society has been handicapped in this area for many reasons that we won't get into on this podcast. Um, but it, God, I was just ranting about it last night and I was talking to you about it. You know, this reality that's been classified 
from our human family for so many reasons and for so long. Um, but obviously it's probably more, you know, complex than, than that. But I kind of just always thought of it like that. Um, because well, it's a, it's because it's a machine, you yeah. know, and and it's putting out a signal, and so are you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you. I, I think you can look at the you can look at the body and see all the trillions of well coordinated um, functions that must come together to keep us going, and there's clearly some higher intelligence behind that, or at least my interpretation would be there's some higher intelligence behind that, and I, I would think of that as our I would think of that as like related to our consciousness somehow. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's maybe a, a different way of saying like a, a soul or something like that. But there's some animating force, some animating principle um, that that's localized in our, our bodies, and our connection to that is what we would call awareness. Right? It's the it's mm-hmm. our first person perspective, uh, and it and it probably leads to a, a much uh, deeper and more interesting uh, existence uh, of our own that has some sort of effect on physical reality that we can't determine yeah you know that that's also basically another way of it's like a bottom-up way of conceiving of the simulation Mm. yeah that's true yeah so the simulation is like it's the computer program and there's some consciousness that is uh of a higher order but it's uh it's like playing our bodies as like characters in the video game right yeah like i mean not like avatar because avatar is more of the kind of a, a voluntary, uh, well, I guess depending on what perspective you look at it from, but like, you know, you have so many choices. It's like, it's like a video game that's been written mm-hmm. and you know, you, you buy the video game, you take it home and, and your job is to explore this house and you can take so many turns and you feel like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm doing all this myself, but all those turns have been mapped out for you, even if they're infinite, you know? And in that respect, so you get to experience free will within the confines, you know, of this great, great game. Is that a simulation though? Yeah, because the game is, what the house you've entered has been crafted, you know, it's been designed by a, by a intelligence. Mm. But there's good news in that, you know, it's like, you can, <laughs> I was reading uh, Conversations with God Neil Donald Walsh, great, great book. If you've never read it, and Neil is arguing with God, and been like, "Why, why, you know, why did you get? Why do we have so many choices?" He was like, "Because I've given you the safest place to make all those choices. You can't go wrong. You know, there's nothing you can do." And he's like, "I don't, you know, I don't believe that. Like, we keep doing terrible things. Like, look at Hitler, and he's." he's it's having this very, you know, human argument with God, and God is constantly replying from a larger perspective. He and that's where I got that video game analogy from. God's like, think of it like this: you have an infinite amount of lives to go in, go into the house and explore and play, and no matter how many turns you take that are wrong, no matter how many times you die, you get to keep doing it again and again and again. What can be a better game than that? And <laughs> Neil was like, I can think of. <laughs> Neil had a lot of problems with this idea that God was telling him about in the book, but um, yeah, simulation theory. I think we'll learn that eventually that we, I mean, it's, I kind of always just imagine that people understand that to some degree, but I, I forget that it's not really that accepted. It's becoming much more widely and science is even like, Hey, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, which is funny when science does that. It's like, oh, conspiracy theorists have been saying this for decades, and now you guys are running tests on it. Um, but so you, at the Paralab, you you stayed there for quite a while, and you worked on some pretty incredible things. Like I, <laughs> I want I want to one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is like, um, well, we're going to talk about your new psychic machine stuff, but you did a fascinating experiment on Jimmy Church's radio show um, that involved water. Mm-hmm. And it, the results you got were significant, just like the results on this experiment we just spoke about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wonder what skeptics say to these results, 
you know, like what, what, what their, the way that they dismiss them in their minds is, how do they justify them? But tell everyone what you did with, with, with Jimmy when you got invited okay. on last minute. Right. So the, <clears throat> the Jimmy Church is this big radio program, right? And he wanted to uh, talk about consciousness effects. And I thought, well, um, let's see if we can do an experiment. So rather than using a random number generator, we used a piece of chemical analysis equipment called EIS, Electrochemical Impedance Spectroscopy. It's, it's a big word, but basically what it means is um, you, you have two vials of water and you're measuring, you're sending electricity through the vials and you're measuring how the resistance of that water changes with some variable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got two vials of water and you add the same water to each of them. You run a baseline, you show that the, uh, the resistance, another way of saying impedance, but the resistance is the same between both. And then you wanna, um, in this case, what we, what we thought we would do is we would send the audience's intention towards one of those. So I had Jimmy pick, you know, A or B, and he picked, uh, I think he picked A, whatever it was. And then the listening audience all sent their intentions into vial A. Right. Right. And then also, because the program was recorded and people listened to it at different times, anyone who had ever listened to that radio show in the future mm. would also send their intentions into vial A uh, back in the past. Right. Right. So, um, so we, we did that and we allowed some time, I think it was like five minutes or something, uh, to, you know, for the effects, right. quote unquote, to, to show up. And then we ran the tests again and we actually saw a difference in the impedance or the resistance of both vials. Now that's not so easily explainable no. because there was no temperature difference in the room. Uh, they were performing equally right. at the baseline. And yet somehow vial A is showing a different resistance than, uh, than vial B. And um, I didn't invent this experiment. Right. There's a, a group of people that have been looking at this. But the first time I heard of it, I thought that's brilliant because there might be something special about water that makes it more susceptible to the influence of consciousness than our, than the electrons or, or photons of a random number generator. And the reason why should be clear, consciousness is attendant to all life, or it's attendant to, to life. Yeah. And life is mostly water, biological life, mm -hmm. right? So maybe there's something special about water. And of course, you know, water has like these, supposedly has like memory and all these interesting things. Supposedly? Yeah. Why supposedly? So, so. Um, I, I believe it probably does. So yeah, but. Do, what fault do you find with Dr. Emoto's work? Because I get into this again with my resident skeptic all the time. I, I have a water crystal tattoo on my chest. Okay. Um, so oh, obviously that's, that's awesome. I, believe in the, I believe in his work. Yeah. And the, the big thing that they say is um, it's never been reproduced. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? It's been reproduced a lot i mean do, do you think that the images you're seeing of the water crystals are the same ones that he took back in the the, the 90s i was like that it it clearly has been reproduced and there's been books but uh, that's what I'm, I'm always hit with because the implications of dr emoto's work um for for those of you who are listening who may not be familiar dr emoto um, was one of the people who really got a lot of publicity for Maybe not one of the people. Maybe maybe one of the first people I should say, um, for for looking to see if memory, like if water could contain um, memory, so to speak. So what he did was, he would he would speak into the water, or sometimes even sing or pray, and he would it would vary from I love you to thank you, you know, and then he would flash freeze the water, um, and he would obviously flash freeze the water and say something like, I hate you, like, um, you're ugly. And then he would look at the structure the water would take on as it was flash freezing under a microscope. And what he found was that the water that was receiving positive attention was remarkably geometric and beautiful, like a, like a, like a snowflake, like, a, like the geometry of a snowflake that has fallen um, from 
from a cloud. Um, and the water that was, you know, insulted and hated on was, was, I mean, there was no geometry. It looked like a bomb went off. It looked like someone like spit on the ground for lack of a better way to describe the, the incoherence, the, the dissonance in, in the structure. And in my mind, the, the, the implication is clear. What is disease, but a dissonance in the cell. It's a, dis, it's a, it's a disruption of the cell structure. There's a lack of coherence. And when we see the coherence return to that cell, oftentimes the health is restored in the individual um, or animal or whatever it is. So the implications are enormous for people who believe in that and for people who dismiss that, you know, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you have to be responsible and mindful for all the shit you've been watching late to the night. Right. I mean, um, the people that you've been hanging around, the constant, you know, there's, there's, if you want to continue to live that lifestyle and imagine that ignorance is bliss, then you can't believe in this stuff. But it's just funny, like I'm, you know, as a, a, a man who works in science, what is your, what is your doubt about? Uh, I'm curious what your doubt about that is. Oh, well. And no judgment at all. Yeah. Like, I'm just curious. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that it didn't happen. Right. Um, I, I'm actually pretty sure that um, Emoto was able to do what he did. And there's many replications in his lab. Right, which is something, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'm actually not doubting it at all. The the, and I'm not too familiar with the the replication attempts. Uh, the you mentioned that the criticism leveled at him is usually that it hasn't been replicated. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's true. I, I think what they mean is like, oh, if this was true, then any other lab could do this and show the results, and and. <clears throat> Sometimes that's true and sometimes that's actually a naive understanding of replication when it comes to consciousness effects. Mm. We, let's, let's take a beat on that one. If you're a psychologist and you're doing experiments on subjects, do you think that you're going to get the same results every single time for every single person? No. No, because people are different and because there are different conditions, that ex there are sub subjective conditions that exist that can't be pinned down, that are slippery, that are always changing. Okay, so now why do we think that if we do a consciousness experiment that's driven entirely by something subjective to the person that we're going to get the same results every time? True. Um, also, if indeed what is being purported here, which is that um, sometimes if you if you believe something is true, you'll get You'll yeah. do these experiments and get these results, and if you disbelieve it, you'll get negative results. That that that's sometimes not true, but some it, it it's an yeah. effect that shows up in the research. So it's funny that um, somebody who's super skeptical and doesn't want it to work might actually <laughs> use the effect, the consciousness effect, to suppress yeah. the results. Yeah. There's this thing that we saw all the time. Um, we called it rubber banding. But let's say that you are a person who is doing a, a, an RNG experiment, a random number generator experiment, and you're looking at a graph that's the real-time feedback of the line either moving up or moving down. In, in the middle is the mean, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're, let's say you want it to move up, and you're seeing it slowly start to move up, <clears throat> something kicks in inside a lot of people that's like, oh shit, it's working. And then it shoots right back down wow. and reverts to the mean. And that sh that shooting back down is actually more statistic statistically significant in, in many cases than the the slow buildup. Mm. Um, and so you might have something like that influencing the outcome of the experiment, and the experimenters don't even know. In both cases, both on the skeptic side and on the believer side, it's probably more of a problem on the believer side actually, um, because they they believe that it works, they want it to work, they're excited, and like it actually has an effect on, on the outcome. Yeah. Um, the same might be true of, of skeptics. So like, look, this is one of the really difficult things about doing any type of um, investigations into consciousness effects is because there's no way to control yeah. for the subjectivity of both the person that's subject and the experimenters. I mean, there, there really isn't. Um, and so like, <laughs> How do you even proceed from that? Yeah. 
it's it's tough you know and it's not just in these sort of parapsychology experiments or psi research experiments um jonathan schooler uh, who's a professor at at uh, UC Santa Barbara, I believe, he's done some really interesting work on the decline effect. And the decline effect is a phenomenon that happens in any type of research, where the first few times you do an experiment, you get positive results, and then it, the effects decline to nothingness. Mm. So a classic, you know, like sort of a, a, an orthodox perspective on that would be, Oh yeah, well they 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 worked out all of the kinks in the experiment and uh, and and they they showed that there was no effect there. Oh yeah, um, so, and that's why we replicate, and that's true to an extent. But you can you can account for that. It's not like people are doing the these these professors are doing these like bad experiments in the beginning. Right. Everything is maintained the same. You forgot to pull the drapes down. Yeah, exactly. Man. <laughs> that's fine. You can you can control for that, and even if you do, even if you do, you still get these decline effects. Um, it's very inconvenient, mm -hmm. I imagine, for for working professional academics. Um, and so, what's up with that? Well, maybe some explanation for that is is that these guys are excited mm -hmm. about their great idea <laughs> working. Yeah. <laughs> and the first few times they do it, they get positive results, and it it might not be to what related to what they think. I mean, the placebo effect is considered real even by skeptics. So sure. we have not, but, but apparently some people have not made the leap. And the, I mean, it's not even a leap. It's a little hop to the fact that, well, where does, how does that work? You know, I mean, it works with the power of your mind, but it's not just power of your mind because the power of your mind is affecting your biochemistry. That is the placebo effect. That's your biochemistry is physical. We, but we have been taught to separate all these things. So it's easy to see how I guess people don't make the leap. But the placebo effect is real. It's so real that they do. They include it in drug trials. You know what I mean? And then they hide the results. <laughs> but um, yeah. So just take the idea of the placebo effect that we know that's that's happening in, inside your body. And like, think about what what would what, what are the implications if that extends beyond the body, like mm. into your experiment? Yeah, that's that's a difficult thing to deal with. Definitely, yeah. it's a it's a it's a fucked up variable. It's 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 rough. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, it it might be what's going on to some yeah. extent. Yeah, um, there's a lot of reason to believe it is what's going on. In a lot of in a lot of ways, um, and it is a it's a profound thing to try to extrapolate then over the field of science you know um it's pretty mind-blowing one more comment on that before we can move on sure. <clears throat> and the important thing to take away from these experiments like the the sci research stuff like the the highest level understanding that you can take from this stuff i think is that anomalies accumulate around meaningfulness in an experiment Hmm. Anomalies accumulate around meaningfulness in an experiment. So what's meaningful to the people doing the experiment will often produce unexpected and insignificant results. So of course, Dr. Emoto is, is going to be getting these unusual results because it's his life's work. Yeah. And not only that, but it's beautiful and it's inspiring millions of people. Right. I would bet that if if others had the same like meaningfulness level around their around their investigations, they would show the same thing. Uh, people that have gone into um, like spontaneous remissions from diseases through like sound healing or mm -hmm. something like that, you can bet it's pretty meaningful. Oh yeah, to the healer and to the the person that's being healed. Now, do you get the same thing in some lab? Yeah. who's like basically trying to disprove it right well it's meaningful to them to disprove it damn right so <laughs> yeah there you go that's amazing right it's a, it's such a it's a conundrum it's a paradox i mean it's a it fits perfectly with this duality that we we live in <laughs> whether you believe it or not you know you're right um 
but I, I had, I had so many, I made so many connections when I was listening to your work and, and, and getting more familiar with some of your recent talks. And, and I've had some remarkable experiments playing with this notion that we can manifest something physical in our reality. Um, but I've also gone through the process of um, uh, ongoing, obviously, um, of, of trying to whittle away at my prior belief systems and habits and um, this programming that wasn't serving me, that I had run into a lot of trouble with in my life. And, and realizing that um, the first thing that, that you need to do to install new software, you know, is to get rid of the old that, that is causing your system to be bugged. And that took a while, but it, but it taught me meditation, it taught me stillness of mind, it quieted that voice, it put me back in control of my body instead of my, having my habits run the show. Um, and then things really started to get interesting from there. I had a lot of trouble manifesting anything until I took the time, which took years to, to get to a place where I was walking around as the person I, want, I, I had wanted to be years before. I was embodying that, you know, that, those, that list you make of all the things that you want to embody in your life and that list of, that shittier list you make of who you are right now, you know, and how you get from A to B to the, to the good list. Um, cause that's where you want to end up. You, you, you want this list to end up no more and this list to be. Mm -hmm. And I feel like once you get at least a, closer to this list, you went, when you align and you you know, with the power of the mind and the power of the heart, then, then, then things start to get very synchronistic and it helps when you have something that you love that you're doing and that you're pursuing and work has become it's still work but it's also play and it's exciting that helps a lot i think um and then i've had these crazy things but i was listening to your and i was thinking i was contemplating this and you know there's all these cliched and hackneyed things that you hear in the spiritual community, like as above, so below, but there's certainly something to it. You know, it's not, it's not for nothing that it's repeated, maybe ad nauseum, <laughs> but I, you know, I was watching your, I looked at your side or slide, whatever they call them with the iceberg, um, about the conscious mind in the material world, subconscious mind in the submaterial world. And, and I was just, I had this glimpse of like, you know, society as we know it and how quietly <laughs> the tires are starting to fall off of this vehicle. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, there are still so many people who have this idea of what it is that we live in and what has gone on. And the fact that so many people are like, no, that's not what happened. This is what is going on. This is what is going on. And the fact that you have to reconcile these two understandings before you can get a coherent, co-conscious society that can create in a way that everyone understands the nature of what is right now. these things show up in relationships, right? So I was just like, my mind was blown because I was like, what's been happening in this society in the last, particularly in the last five years, but also, you know, under the seams in the last 20, 30 years is the, 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 the subconscious program, so to speak, in other words, the, 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 the strongest signal that is being put out, which is being put out by the authority and, and the government and the religions in our society, you know, is, is now manifesting stronger. And the quiet, small, conscious part, the little part of, of this society that is like, you know, we're free and, and America is the, we're the best and we're the heroes and everyone loves us. and, and the rest of us are like, no, man, no. 
that's not what has happened. You know, there's a reason why there's such vitriol for this country, and it's because of our we have been imperial bullies for for you know 75 years, and there has been atrocities committed, and you're not aware of them because you've not been taught. But this is the policy that we've been putting out. This is the foreign policy. This is the this is the mess that we've created and and, and then dominated with. And so now you're seeing, I think, because it comes out in relationships, right? And slowly but surely, these unresolved, unacknowledged kind of things that are part of your programming are they're going to come out in 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 your life, and, I, and that's what's happening in our society right now on a on a massive scale. And I was just and I was just looking at this model that you made that I'll show everyone who's watching. Um, and it's an iceberg, and on it's divided into four. And on the left, top left is conscious mind, bottom left is subconscious mind, top right material world, bottom right submaterial world. And the iceberg, you know, it looks like two when you look at it from the top above water. But on the bottom, you see it's all one big giant iceberg that's connected. And I don't know, it, it just blows my mind that we are seeing things unravel the way we are. And I was like, but it was bound to happen because we were living, for the most part, you know, kind of being undercut by these nefarious intentions. And I don't know, I, that to me is another way that in, in actual intention is manifesting itself in physical reality. As you're seeing the, the, the dissolvement of the illusion that we are this hunky-dory notion of of a country yes as in our own lives sometimes when the curtain is pulled back you realize that there is a lot of trouble there and it sooner or later was going to manifest right? so um, in our own lives we've got shadow selves and demons and you should, the first step is to, to see them, to look at it and to, yeah. and to see it for what it is and take responsibility and go, yeah, that's, that needs work. Yeah. And how does your, and that's in your subconscious. So how does your conscious mind tell you that you need to look at this and resolve it? Well, maybe that's what this reality is. This is, is a technology to show you that. This is far out with Faust, so we can, yeah. you know. No, but, absolutely. But maybe it is. And maybe if, if this is some sort of simulation, uh, maybe that's a, one of the purposes of it, is um, to align, uh, to, to see and experience firsthand and align uh, these deeper parts of yourself. Yeah. Now, that's what's happening to each of us individually in our own timelines, in our own movies. Mm-hmm. Um, the same thing seems to be happening to society writ large. Uh, there were there were big problems that we had not completely ignored, but a lot of us had yeah. had had to tune out. And uh, I think in the past couple of years and continuing now, and we've seen that the curtain has been pulled back, and we've got a situation. There's some bad stuff going on, and the first step is to actually see it. Yeah. Right. And then you've got to admit that. You know, you've you've got a problem here. And, yeah, shine a light on it. Um, speaking of far out ideas. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm just going live here. Like this isn't like a fully formed go for set it. of thoughts, go but you know, it it occurs to me that this uh, this physical reality, right, is. Metaphysically, it's a it's a reality of, of duality, right? So duality seems to be this like uh, metaphysical first principle of the world that we see and the world that we live in. You have uh, dark and night, and male and female, and um, all of these things like good and like all these things that you can look at that are these um, these these dualities. And maybe what we're supposed to do is somehow find some reconciliation between them. And it's a bit of a puzzle. But to do that means to progress spiritually, mm -hmm. or to uh, to grow as as consciousness or grow as a person. 
and that could be a reason why we're here as well. Um, and perhaps also this sort of alignment of, and maybe what we call the subconscious mind is some somehow like part of the mechanism of how that works and how we fit into it. Absolutely. Uh, and it's such a fucking paradox, excuse my French. Um, you know, <laughs> it's to, to be human is, it's a crazy experiment. Experience and experiment. You know, I was, I was telling you last night, I, I had that little spot on my ear that they found that was, that came back and, you know, was skin cancer. And, and I had it, I had it snipped off and it healed great. And, and meanwhile, while I was healing, I was going through and I was creating this tension and I was seeing my body like completely white, you know, like this in this bathe in this white light, in this diamond form and free of, of anything of that nature. And I healed really quick. And they were like, you need a skin graft. You're not going to be able to feel your ear. It's going to be flat. And I was like, you leave that to me. I don't need a skin graft. I'll take care of my ear. You just get that stuff uh, out and uh, send me home. Yeah. And I came back and they were like, oh, this is remarkable. So when did you get feeling back? I was like, I never lost feeling. I told you <laughs> it's fine. Um, they were like, it looks great. It's healed so fast. Fantastic, right? So remember what my intention was while I was meditating. I go back three months later for a checkup and they're like, you're great. You're, you know, we'll see in three months. I was like, wait a minute. There's this, I got this red spot on my, on my chest. Right? And they're like, oh, that's nothing. And I was like, yeah, I know it's nothing. It's like the size of, a, you know, a thumbnail. I'm sorry. A, a, a what do you call it? A, a nail. It's the size of a of, the, of a head of a nail. You know, it's not. But it's. I was like, it's red and it won't go away. I was like, so either you're gonna cut it off or I'm gonna perform some surgery at home. So and they were like, okay, fine. So they they cut it off and they and I got a call a week later saying that this was a different kind, much less serious kind of basal sarcoma. And I was like, fuck. Urgh. I was, I was so upset. I was so pissed. But what had happened? I mean, if I was, my intention was to become free of, of anything of like this on my body, then I had to first shine a light on it. Mm -hmm. I had to find a way to discover it. And I did. And of course I got like, a, like a, my reaction was probably childish and um, I was, I was livid. I was like, God, suck. you know, but what happened, but what happened was I found a way to, um, bring a light to the other, maybe what the only other part, you know, of my body that had some of this that needed to be discovered and then, you know, taken out. Um, that's what happened. That's what my intention was. Now, how it came to me and my reaction to it are two different things, but, but I did find a way to find the rest of it, you know, which happened to be this little tiny, innocent looking red mark, um, on the bottom, on top of my rib. And now I have stitches there, but my, but my intention is, was to become free. And I have. I was upset at the news because I was like, oh, so I, you know, I failed and this, all this stuff. But it's amazing how the universe works and, and what a paradox things are. Because it took me a, a little mo a while to reflect on everything that went on. And I was like, did you, you are getting what you, did you not want to be free of this, of, of, of this, whatever is, you know, going on? Yeah, that's what's happened. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's. But first, you got to find a way to shine a light on it. You know? mm -hmm. And I was like, "Listen, I know you said it's cool, but something in my intuition and/or vanity was like, but I don't like the way it looks. You're right. It's fucking crazy, man. Um, but it's a good thing because if I had been like, yeah, I'm cool, you know, it probably would have just got bigger and worse. And so, it's just the universe is, has a way of bringing you." you know, what you need to see, I think. The question is, what will you do with it? <laughs> yeah. 
much of the time. But um, I don't know if that story is 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 well related or or fits with what we're talking about. But I just thought I would share it. Yeah, I think you know? so. I yeah. think so. I mean. There's, there's a lot that you could extrapolate from the basic ideas of mind effect matter. Yeah. Right. And um, the little iceberg that I showed you there is a, is a model to think about mind and matter and the, the deeper interconnectedness there. Um, and I, I found it to be like a, a good, it's, it's a good um, symbol yeah. maybe for how I've come to think of this stuff. Absolutely. It's, in, it's, it's inspiring, at least to me. Um, <laughs> what happened to your mind lamp? Why can't I buy one? <laughs> um, yeah, so here's so he, here's the mind lamp. <clears throat> the mind lamp is a desk light. Inside the desk light is a random number generator that's controlling what color the lamp becomes. So if the uh, random number generator is performing normally, like its baseline, then it's white. And if it starts to deviate into the realm of statistical anomaly, then it will trigger a secondary function which randomly turns one of a couple different colors. So the idea is that you could explore this mind-matter interaction stuff with a cool visual color-changing desk lamp yeah. instead of a dry, boring, you know, graph with right. numbers and stuff. And <clears throat> when the when the Paralab closed down. Uh, a couple of of buddies, uh, we got together basically and we created this little company called Cyleron and the, the, the purpose was to build low cost, high quality random number generator tools for other labs or interested people um, to be able to carry on this type of work. Like, do your own research. Right. Well, the, you know, the, the random number generators that were used in labs were like 50 grand. Wow. No one's going to do their own research. Right. But um, with these uh, low cost, you know, you can do your own research and, you know, the, the st the st we make the stats easy and so forth. So we did that and the response was like better than we thought for the research tools. And so uh, a couple of guys that uh, were there decided to create uh, the, like an another batch of products just to see if, if these would sell. And one of them was the mine lamp. So um, this was never supposed to be you know, we weren't really a widget company. Right. Uh, it was something that we were doing as kind of a, an homage to, to the Paralab that you know, we were so fond of. And so there were only, I think, 3,000 lamps ever made, something like that. I, I, we made them all by hand. I glued every single one <laughs> of them. <laughs> wow. Um, and that was, gosh, that was 2008 to 2011, something like that. So they're out there and every now and then someone will reach out to me and with, with a photo of their mind lamp, you know, I love this thing. This thing's awesome. Yeah. Um, tell, cool. tell everyone how it worked. So you can create low cost and effective, uh, like true real quantum random number generators mm -hmm. in a number of different ways. Uh, one is called reverse bias diodes, but basically you take a, these electrical components called diodes and you, you assemble them in a certain way that you can take advantage of what's called a, a quantum tunneling effect or an electron tunneling effect. And you can think of this as like you're throwing electrons against an electromagnetic barrier and either it bounces off or that electron like quote unquote tunnels through, hmm. which it sort of takes this quantum jump to the other side. And then you can measure the relative balance of bounces versus tunnels and that becomes a one or a zero. And because of, the, of that, that, the uh, quantum tunneling effect being not predictable, you end up with pure random physical driven uh, numbers. Okay, <clears throat> so that's, you're getting, you know, your typical ones and zeros. If it's 50-50, the light is going to be white. Right. And then let's say that um, over the next trial period, you get, um, you know, 51% ones and zeros, which doesn't seem like much, but in statistical terms, when you're talking um, binomial distributions, that's that can be quite significant, right. like, depending on the sample size. So you know that there's something going on. Maybe it's the influence of your consciousness. Maybe it's just, you know, something else, randomness, mm -hmm. but there's something going on. And then 
it when it detects that there's something going on, it will pick uh, one of those eight colors and let's say it turns blue. So your experience as a user would be, you approach this white light, you think of a color, mm, I want it to be green. And then you just watch it and um, th this thing really works by the way. Yeah. It, it, uh, it will slowly start to turn green and then when it turns fully green, then you've got it. Right. Right. And then now somebody else can say, well, that was amazing. Like, let's do red. And they'll think, you know, they'll think red and it may or may not come up. But, um, you know, most people are pretty damn good at getting it the first few times. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can you can record this over time and see how how effective they actually are, like right. in terms of odds against chance. One of the cool things that I was able to do in San Francisco was... Um, we got a, a, a green light and a little grant from the city of San Francisco to turn this into a public art installation. Oh yeah, yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. And uh, working with um, an architect friend of mine, Jane, we built these giant pyramids, like these big domes mm -hmm. that are, were you know nine feet tall. You could step inside of them. And uh, your the sort of head area around you um, was all white mm -hmm. and it was being lit by random number generator. So there was just instructions, no explanation about what this is, but just instructions on the on the bottom that says, think of a color. So so if you're just walking down the street of San Francisco, <laughs> um, you'd step, you'd see this thing, think of a color, you'd step into it and it'd be all white. And then like you're thinking red and all of a sudden it turns red. Yeah. And you're like, holy shit, how did that happen? Right. Um, <clears throat> just this, this sort of like opportunity to have an unexplained experience mm -hmm. that sh that you wonder how that's possible and so we we actually had this set up for a week um right in, in downtown san francisco on on market in powell and uh we we just we were there for eight hours just watching people and um from from morning to night there was a line wow like you know dozens and dozens of people long just waiting to step into this thing. Um, and, you know, they're wondering like how this is possible. And, you know, a lot of them were really, you know, quite perplexed at yeah. how it, like, what the what's fuck? the sensor here? Like, but are you, are you measuring like brain waves? Like what's going on? How is it? That's, and they were like, is this thing reading my mind? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it must've been so trippy for people. Um, and it, how many colors could it create? Eight. Eight colors. And how, what, what, what the thing that gets me is, so basically those people were influencing this number of random generators to all tumble, let's say to tumble, you know, to stop by chance into an effect that would create the color purple, so to speak. So that makes the odds of that again, being pretty fucking crazy. I mean, even if you're just talking about eight colors, for someone to walk in, think of red, and then have all those, because I think of them like either dices, like like dice, maybe dice is plural, or like a, like a roulette wheel that has to, you know, land on and or the ball has to fall into a certain number, predominantly for it to be that color. That's the effect, right? And if it's a, if it's random number generator and it's responding to this person's chance thoughts of red, how do you deny the effect that the mind has on matter? I mean, that is a, that's a great experiment for people who, you know, try to chew on if you if you doubt that there is at least something you know scientifically sound behind these concepts, um, and that the law of attraction is not all woo woo i know it's been widely <laughs> spread and and turned into a lot of woo woo for people you can't prove it man i was like you can prove it you can prove it to yourself you know run it do an experiment i have think of something that is fucking wild and crazy that only you are going to recognize when it shows up in your life i mean it could be something as simple as this and then go into like a deep deep meditation i've done this you know what I found? You know what I got? I'll show you. I'll 
purple fucking basketball. Okay. We. <laughs> hmm. I I found this. I, I did this on June twenty third, two thousand seventeen. I wrote it down. Dr. Joe said, write, write down whatever it is. He said, it has to be something that you've never seen before and that you're going to recognize when you see it because it's, it's unique. I was like, this is my brain functioning was at an all time. I was like, I don't know. That's something I've never seen before. I never saw a purple basketball in my life. <laughs> so I wrote it down. That was June 23rd, 2017, right? Yep. On June 28th, 2018. So I did, you know, I, I went into this, we, we went go deep into this meditation and we're, you know, we're like in the quantum field, so to speak. And then we do this visualization and I, and I'm in the void. It's black. I'm thinking of this purple basketball and it's glowing, right? It's, 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 it's got this neon -y, tinge to it and I'm like and then I you know I, 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 I it was like an hour and a half as a deep meditation and then I forgot about it but I wrote it down I remember the meditation vividly and almost a, a year to the date later on June 28th in 2018 I was walking through my kids were my kids were young and we were walking through a mall in Chicago and we went to the store and I was like, let's get out of this store. It's for babies. It's for, it's for infants. And my wife's like, yeah, we're just, we're just looking around, you know, um, you know, they had, they didn't have any cool toys for like kids. Our kids were too old for this store. And I'm like, yeah, all right, can we go? You know? And I, 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 I turn around and I'm, I'm looking at a <laughs> Let me show you what I'm looking at. This thing that's glowing at me. I was like, what the? A fucking purple. And I was like, no, that's, that's a baby ball. That's not a basketball. And then I pick it up and it says basketball. I was like, what the fuck? And it was glowing just like it was in my meditation. <laughs> and ironically, the company that makes it is called Tangle. 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 Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Almost like your app. That's a good story. Night basketball. I was like, well, it took me a year for it to show up. And it even glowed. I was like, what, the fuck? what kind of basketball? Who, make, who makes a purple basketball that glows in the dark? Um, I mean, I, I think the thing. I was like, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> and did, did you remember? You remembered immediately because you took the photo. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, what? No. And I was like, it's not a basketball. This is, I'm a mat, you know, this is. But then it said basketball real big on it. <laughs> you know, with, with the mind lamp and with this type of experiment, it's not like it's working every single time right. in the way that you expect, right? Um, but it's working more often than it should by chance. Sometimes a lot more often than it should by chance. Okay. That's, that's how it works. I mean, that's, that's amazing. That's something to, you know, publish science about. Um, I was telling you I got to find that one experiment that they did about the prayer um i'm gonna dig it up before we're, we're done but you know um i was raised in a religious i mean my family wasn't religious but we were forced to do religious things like go to church and go to catholic school and meanwhile i came home and my dad was like god damn it motherfuckers you know i was like do we have to go to confession now because we <laughs> but um <laughs> You know, becoming spiritual has been liberating in many ways for me. Notions of damnation and hell, they're not healthy for children. <laughs> and uh, to, say, to say the least, it could be traumatizing. Um, but but under, getting a spiritual understanding of reality and life has... It's changed the way I think about everything in, in, in the nature of God, you know. And the more I learn, at least for me, the more I see a divine intelligence in, in all things. And, and you kind of work in the field of, of this kind of synchronicity where these two things tend to interplay. And I'm wondering how it's 
if it has changed your understanding or and how it has changed your understanding of, of the universe or God or whatever you want to call it. You know, it, it's often been said that there is a God-shaped hole at the center of modern man. And I can see that. I can see that. Um, I expect that, you know, what we call spirituality is filling that hole of um, like the sort of higher intelligence and, and meaning to it all for a lot of people, myself included. Um, and then for some, there's a subset of that that's taking what you can learn from the, the experiments that people have done or the research and using that as the foundation upon which you build your worldview. Right, or at least your kind of your, your spiritual worldview. Mm -hmm. Sounds like that's kind of you too. Yeah. Right. So you can look at the, like the pair examples and the global consciousness project and the Emoto work and um, prayer research and all of these things, and um, <clears throat> you can you can start to sort of put it all together. There's there's many more, by the way. Mm -hmm. Right. In all, in, you know, there's the whole like UFO stuff, and you know, yeah. are we alone? And you can. You can kind of um, bottom up rebuild a a worldview that is, to the extent possible, um, rooted in experimental outcomes and stuff that you know you, you believe in, and that is, uh, I mean, that's an activity that I think is going on largely privately, but it's mm -hmm. it's it's happening massively around the world right now. That's why when you go to conferences that are like. Uh, I'll, I'll go to these supposedly UFO conferences, but uh, all I talk about is just consciousness right, research. Right. It's like I never said that I was some sort of UFO <laughs> person, but they they keep They're inviting invited. me yeah. to come just talk about consciousness research. And yeah. the, and um, I think, and then other other topics too. And you can have these conversations about anything with these people, and it's because they've put in decades of work in many cases, or at least a lot of years of work, to try to synthesize their own worldview because the, the received knowledge just doesn't make any sense to them. Right. Right. And so they're, they're seekers and they're, they're actually sort of puzzle piecing it together. Um, which is one of the cool things about the, the sort of alternative research community is, yes. is um, they actually have, um, well, they have a lot of interesting knowledge and interesting things to say, and they've done the work to try to connect it to other stuff. So your question was, how does this fit into my, my sort of, personal and how and has it changed your personal evolving understanding yes the the, the mind matter interaction stuff you know I, once you're satisfied that there's something going on there then you wonder how does how do my thoughts actually affect the world and there's still a gap there like in terms yeah. of explaining how the the micro psychokinesis stuff that we're looking at is generalizable to your life and and you know maybe it isn't necessarily but um but certainly metaphorically it is and and then um so you start looking at patterns that are showing up in your life and connecting them to thoughts that you were having and you get a new you sort of get this like the first thing that happens is you get a you start thinking about the synchronicities that show up yeah that's basically the first thing that happens. And you, and you s stop looking at them as pure, unadulterated coincidence. Coincidence, yeah. And start looking at them as, well, perhaps there's actually, you know, I'm driving this to some extent. It's either, it's, it's like my subconscious affecting something in the world to conspire to bring me like the thing that is related to what I was thinking or that's some sort of message or something. And then once that happens, then you start to get into like a conversation with it. Mm -hmm. You develop, um, you start to develop a relationship to what's inside and what's outside, and some connection between the two. Okay, so um, then that's just a deeper rabbit hole that, that leads you into what turns out to be thousands of years of wise people mm. uh, telling you important stuff about this. Um, the this the science stuff is is a portal to, in my opinion, it's a portal to ancient wisdom, right? And that ancient wisdom comes from, you know, from the Vedics and the modern mystics in India to, um, to people that have, 
uh, gone deep into their own sort of like um, religious devotional prayers um, experiences to the like the shamans and um, they all kind of tell you that look there's there's a deeper consciousness uh, reality that we're a part of and that we're experiencing and um, first of all clear out all of that darkness inside of you to the extent that you yeah. can um, and uh, you know do the work for for you know your inner healing right. and, and because it's like what they would say is basically like the world is even more of a reflection of what's inside of you than you think with the synchronicity stuff mm -hmm. um, and some of them will say that it's like all a reflection of like I'm not I'm not sure if I'm quite there yet but it's it's something like that um, so you know I think that that's it's been for me a portal to be much more open it was a it was a portal to to ancient wisdom yeah right to yoga and to meditation um even to like some of the traditions in western psychology like Jungian psychology and so forth yeah and it, it, there's others in the community that are also interested in like their grand unified theory of everything right right that's another fun thing about this community is um everyone has a a grand unified <laughs> theory that unites gravity and electromagnetism and consciousness and recovers all of the anomalies and uh, you know all these things and um, some are better than others yeah um, <laughs> I, I can't help but to I mean I'm I'm not a physicist I'm right like I don't think that I could do that kind of stuff but like I, I I'm friends with a lot of them yeah. that are doing this work and they they have many of them so like a super elegant uh, ways of, of thinking completely differently about uniting, mm -hmm. uh, uniting physics. And um, so that's, you know, I'm interested in reading that stuff too. I, I kind of, I've said this before in other podcasts in different ways, but I'm, I, I'm fond of thinking about the, uh, physical reality as a consciousness first place, mm. not a matter first place that that consciousness emerges out of or is interconnected with somehow, but maybe a little bit more of a consciousness first uh, reality. Um, and matter is, is somehow should be understood in that wider context. Uh, I don't necessarily think that it's all consciousness, although sometimes depending on the day that you ask me, yeah. I'll be like, oh yeah, like I'm a panpsychist, everything <laughs> is consciousness. Yeah. Or I'm even like I'm an idealist, which is everything is mind. Right. Um, but it's 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 something like that um and uh so yeah cool no that's um there's certainly something to be said about it i mean you are we are experiencing some everything in our minds to a large degree you know one of the arguments that neil donald walsh always has with god when he's like how do i know this is real he's like how do i know this isn't all in my head and god's like neil it is all in your head Everything's all in your head. <laughs> How else could you experience it but in your head? That's why you have it, you know. And he's like, "Yeah, that's right. Damn it." Um, and and I think that there's a, there's a case to be made for that, you know. I I don't. I certainly think that consciousness is not given its due diligence, you know, as far as our understanding. And I think that you know, as much as some of the spiritual community is a little let's say, um, too focused or too excited and eager about this whole ascension into, um, you know, higher dimensions and realms. I, I do believe that um, we are evolving as a species. And I think that if you, you know, like, you know, even if you're like, but are we evolving um, spiritually? So many of us are, I think, there are some people who are very stuck in a rut, you know, of past programs being passed on. And, in, you know, it, we're indoctrinated into a set of beliefs that is not necessarily akin to this new world. Um, a lot of those people ha also happen to have a shit ton of money and power, unfortunately, uh, and, and have crazy beliefs about who is superior and, and, and for why, what reason. But, um, where was I going with that? Uh, 
but but I I do think that you know it, just watch a movie from 1972. Watch the movie of the year. Good luck. It's very difficult. Some of them are very difficult to watch. Hmm. Um, even a movie that you thought was the bee's knees when you were a kid, sometimes mm. you're like laughing at it now. I mean, maybe not when you're a kid, but even as a young adult, you know, you're like, this is terrible. Nobody talks like this. And yeah, so, <laughs> you know, it's not just the acting, but it's, but the, the writing, you know, what was then, um, you know, considered to be compelling is, I mean, it's just no longer even, it's just not entertaining at all anymore. You know what I mean? Like, it's like art often reflects, you know, these things. I don't know. I, I, it, to me, it's just like the consciousness of, of society has clearly changed and evolved in a way that is more sophisticated because it's hard for me to enjoy an old John Wayne movie. You know what I mean? Like nobody talks like that. Nobody acts like that. Fucking, it's a, it was a different world then. It seems like we've evolved at least a little since the days of, you know, True Grit and John Wayne and and that kind of entertainment. But that entertainment reflects what people considered captivating back then. So, well, do you do you think that? Um maybe this is a question for you as a as a actor and producer but um do you think that it was just back then it was a an affectation that actors would put on it was like now i'm acting right versus today i think there's more of a the style is authentic and brando and the and the actor studio made that you know a they had that ripple effect you know, when when Brando and, and, and realism and sometimes too realism, you know, became the style and, and Brando did Tennessee Williams on Broadway with Streetcar Named Desire, that had a profound effect on the entire industry and it rippled out throughout Europe and everybody's style changed and they became, you know, they, were, they wanted to, they became, they tried to uh, truly adopt the feelings even if that meant putting themselves in situations that they would have never thought to do before. Um, I think that back then people really did talk crazy like that, you know, like, and I, ne I thought, cause I, I would watch videos from like, um, you know, like I would listen to the, to politicians and even they had this weird affectation at the time. And you learn about these, the nuances in the accent dialect, you know, it was um, like mid-Atlantic. Mid-Atlantic. Yeah, you know. we should bring that back. I know, right? We, we sounded so cool. Yeah, it, it was <laughs> awesome. Classy. Yeah. Now we, we've got basically generic English. Yeah. Or like lower class English, but yeah. we don't have like a this like no. sophisticated fancy English, mm. which you can rib people for using. Right. Yeah. We we need we need mid-Atlantic. Society is missing that. Damn it. The British still use it. You know, if you hear the, the hundred percent. You know. Yeah. Listen to fucking the king over there when he talks or even the up the oligarch you know the that live in britain their rp you know their british rp is very very well, i don't know how you would describe it. it's very it's stilted you know everything is very over pronounced yeah you know it's quite posh it's haughty yeah it's nice to listen to right and cockney developed as a as a reaction to oh, that mm-hmm they were like, no, fuck those blokes because that <laughs> don't speak in a way that you can understand anything they're saying, you know. And they they, became, they 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 created their own little version of English, which is so that the fucking rich and the upper class couldn't understand what they were saying. Mm. God bless them. That's brilliant. That's good. Yeah. And it was crazy as it still exists. In, yeah. Well, England as a as a sample of accent, like English types of speaking accents, is really interesting because. Um, like there's 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 not just those two right Cockney yeah. and is there like there's Liverpool which is its own completely different accent and you know different Welsh Welsh yeah um, but sometimes and and those have been there for a long time but then you'll have these communities that are separated by like a road <laughs> or a river or something in 2024 they still speak differently yeah it's wild it's fucking how, nuts. how does that persist in a, in a it's in, it's 
regional and cultural. Same thing in Ireland. You know, you go to a Dublin and, and the accent there is very is very timid. You know, it's 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 got a little bit of sound to it, but they don't. They're just very very typically Irish. But if you go west, you can't fucking understand a word they're saying. You know, everything gets fucking. <laughs> And then north is more English, and you know the sound changes. Forget about Scotland. And then for fucking Scotland, <laughs> forget about it. You know, um, God, that's the that was Scottish is the hardest accent. Scottish and Jamaican, believe it or not. I mm. mean, maybe I'm genetically predisposed not to do Jamaican well, but I had so much. I got. I, I was. I missed the day where our fucking assignments were given for when I was getting my master's. We were all had to pick an accent and then get it down enough to teach the class. <laughs> And I fucking skipped class that day. And I got back and they were like, all oh, that stuff is Jamaican. I was like, but how am I gonna, how is this gonna? And they were like, oh, I guess you shouldn't have missed class. I was like, fuck. <laughs> so you got stuck with Jamaican? Because <laughs> nobody else wanted to do it? No one else wanted to do it. <laughs> I was like, dad, this sucks, man. I had so much trouble with that. I, I found um, one of the, one of the well, guys. You know, as, a, as a classically trained <laughs> Shakespearean actor in New York, being able to nail the Jamaican accent right. is probably going to be very beneficial for you. I had my moments, and I, and I did Shakespeare really well. I was considered one of the people in my class who, you know, had a good handle. Can you do Shakespeare in a Jamaican accent? Dude, that's a great question. I, can, I imagine you can. It's probably fucking world changing. <laughs> but this, let's... I want to talk to you about this this far out subject, man. That's, that I've heard a lot of people talk about, like whistleblowers, um, and the fact that you're working on on this, you know, um, in in a public public kind of way. You know, it just also validates what I understand and what I, you know, one of the things that even even Bob Lazar, you know, reported has been reporting since he came out, like to the public to keep himself alive, basically. Because uh, those aerospace companies, <clears throat> you know, they don't like whistleblowers. I don't know if you have saw the recent news about that guy who self, even the, even the legacy media put self-inflicted in quotes about his gunshot wound. Yeah. Because it was so belligerently not self It's not a good look. Not a good look for Boeing. Anyway, um, they don't like whistleblowers. And, um, but a, a lot of these guys have come forward. Bob Lazar was one of them who said that what they couldn't understand about the technology they retrieved in these crash retrievals was that there were no switches. There were no, there was no steering wheel, you know, that there was a seat and that, that, that the, 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 and then of course there was reports that came out about survivors, you know, who were willing to share information even though we were keeping them in a way captive, I guess, um, about their ships were run with their minds, you know, and that, and that technology, when they started to work on it, took them so long to actually, you know, produce any kind of working, functioning model for a human to use. Um, but last I read in this, this guy, he's a, he's knee deep in everything what he calls exopolitics and aerospace and the ongoing kind of conspiracy but he you know he has a lot of insiders who paint a picture about how far they've gotten with this technology like a ship that will respond to the pilot's mind and be, and can be programmed and attuned to it i'm wondering what you think about that cuz when i hear that i'm like that's the future you know of of, te of technology is going to be, you know, like you, before you go ahead and get your Elon Musk sponsored, you know, plastic chip implant, maybe hold off for something a little less intrusive <laughs> because it's coming, I think. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> uh, I, like you, have also heard that uh, the reports that uh, these, these craft are piloted by some sort of consciousness interface. I think that's been part of the UFO lore for yeah. for as long as, well, for, for decades. So I have no problem believing that that's true. And, you know, maybe here's one way to look at it. 
current interfaces, let's take a phone for example. It used to be that you had like a rotary dial and then you had a keypad and then you had a, a touch screen and then you didn't have to touch anything at all and you would just say, hey Siri, dial whatever. And um, now we're kind of moving into the implantables or devices that can measure what your brain, not just consciousness, but what your brain is doing, mm -hmm. right? And I, I don't know too much, honestly, about the Neuralink. I know, I know what it's trying to do, but in terms of its results, I'm not so sure. But I'm familiar with some of the work that's been connecting um, visualization to brain states and then looking at somebody's brain states and saying, oh, I think that you're, you're visualizing a box or a dog or something, mm -hmm. and it's true. And that's, uh, that's um, way more generalizable than I thought. I thought that would, no way that's not generalizable from one person to the next. Turns out it is more wow. than at least this preliminary, but I was wrong. Like I was surprised by that. And this is all conventional stuff. So <clears throat> um, just map that on a curve to, to see where we are and then just keep going a little bit further. Yeah. And who knows how far, you know, to see where we would be in decades or hundreds of years or thousands. Yeah. yeah, thousands of years. No problem at all. Millions. Sure. In a lot of these, in a lot of the cases. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, even if we're at the point where we're, we've established that there's an, an anomalous effect in quantum systems or random number generators connected to consciousness, well, you know, right. It's, it's not like we haven't taken the first steps. Exactly. Exactly. And there will come a time, I think, in our society when we are we we are not so I'm gonna say, say handicapped by this material, you know, view, uh, and forced to, into the confines of it because a lot of the research that we should be doing um, won't get funded because of you. I mean, you you make a proposal to the people with money and about this and unless they see a way to capitalize it they're you're not going to get a grant you know i mean you need someone who you need one of these trillionaires to have a existential you know kundalini experience <laughs> and fucking just just really throw a monkey wrench in it you know i see i don't think that's musk i think musk is kind of i think he's more controlled and i'm and i heard that these the animals who he's putting his implant in are not doing so well so it's uh, the <laughs> idea of taking the, you know, taking the implant is not palatable to me. No. Um, me either. But you know, I, I think that um, the incentive for wealthy people to put some money into this stuff uh, has, has always been there. And in fact, they've done it more than people realize. Uh, many of the consciousness research uh, um, was funded by the billionaires. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. um, Those rogue billionaires. That care about people. <laughs> I shouldn't say. I shouldn't generalize. Yeah. You know, I, I. Well, that's that's a whole other story. Yeah. But I, I think it's a different world now than it was back then. There's not really a, a stigma associated with putting money into consciousness research or even you know yeah. UFOs. <clears throat> but here, here's the here's the real problem with that. And the, the problem that's basically been the real practical problem uh, for the past decades of getting people to fund this kind of stuff and develop it. It has to do with it, this. If you're a super wealthy person and you've become satisfied that there's enough there there to go forward with this stuff, and you yeah. want to invest in something. You've got money and you've got business know-how because that's what explains your situation. Right. So you know, you know, how, to, you know how to get this stuff done. So then you, you go and you talk to the people that are investigating these things. And most of them are like these garage inventors or, you know, yeah. people like me right? <laughs> who, um, well, I'd like to think I'm a little bit more measured, but uh, they, they're difficult to work with. Mm. They are paranoid. Um, they have some they have some sort of like secret sauce to it yeah uh, and it becomes very impractical to, to try to get something out um, then even if you wanted to do that you'd say well okay well the first step is let's 
let's verify that this stuff is true. Often, right. often it isn't true, often it's wrong. But if it is, then it's like, well, you got to patent it. And so now you've got to somehow make a patent case for your device. Um, let's say that you've, 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 uh, you've got like a thought switch, right? Right. Where you can, you can flip a switch with your, with your mind, right? It uses some sort of mind matter interaction technology. Right. Um, there's very few actual laboratories that are reliable that are doing this stuff and there's a lot of like and the effects might be real but like okay now you got to go patent this stuff so you've got to like write it up in a way that's going to get one past the goalie right and patent examiners yeah um you know their their job is to to filter out stuff that isn't true or could be true or could not be true and and um they're probably very busy yeah. And they've got to operate from a certain set of assumptions about how science, how, how physics works, how nature right. works. <clears throat> Not to say that like there's actually never been a problem with patenting the, the sort of mind matter interaction stuff, but you know that that's an obstacle too. Right. And then um, from there, it's like okay, well, you've got a technology that works, but it doesn't work all the time. And that's one of the things that you're supposed to show with a patent that it works consistently. Well, even if you got a patent, it's like there's there's a practical question here, which is like how can you build technology that doesn't work the same way for all people and it right. doesn't work at the same time? It just works more often than it should by chance. <laughs> Fuck. Like yeah. imagine your phone it's like, well, maybe it'll turn on, maybe it won't. I hope it's a good day today. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to be in the right state. Like it's yeah. And a lot of these things are are something like that, meaning that there are anomalies that are that resist conventional explanation, but they're slippery. Yeah. Like you can't really pin it down. So now you, you as a business person have got to like, you're basically, do I deploy this? Do I deploy my capital? Do, do I deploy my precious time into something that has all of these obstacles, um, all of these like characters involved? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> so I heard about this experiment you did with a roulette wheel, my friend. Um, I myself have, had some luck. <laughs> Let's call it luck. Um, playing with this um, now. So behind me is a is a shelf, and on that shelf is a bunch of comic books, um, and they're graded books because they're collector's items, and um, you know, so so a lot of them. Are, are some of the most sought after books that a comic book collector could want. Um, and they're very difficult to find and then to buy them is, it's a lot of money, right? Um, 10,000, 25,000, 55,000, 75,000 sometimes, you know. Um, and then the, the, the prices vary depending on the market. You know, they, they will rise or fall with the economy. A lot of times they, they'll, they'll hover but then you know we know when a, we can tell when a book is overdue to take a price hike anyway i've i've read comic books my whole life I've collected them i i've discovered this community on instagram that that um they raffle comic books which is cool because most people could never afford to buy a first appearance of spider-man amazing 15 uh amazing fantasy number 15. the book is one of the most sought after books in the world you know and it's even like a, even the cover of it, a ripped cover is worth thousands, you know? Oh. So you get a book that's intact, even if it's in tatters, it's worth money, worth a lot of money. So um, it's not a book I would be ever be able to like, all right, well, I want this, so I'm gonna go and pay, you know, $65,000 for a copy of it, even though it's not that great of a copy. But, I will buy a hundred dollar ticket into a raffle that has, let's say, I don't know. I think the one I won was thirty six hundred one hundred dollar spots. Maybe I'll even buy two tickets, depending on how lucky I feel. Um, and and I went from, you know, taking a chance and not thinking I had a, tr a chance of winning too, realizing why one of my friends was winning, you know, because he had won 
because he had already won one. And he knew he could win another one. That, that is what I, I gained and garnered from, from doing these raffles with him. And his whole understanding of the process and the way he was detached from the results, but also had an inkling that he was going to win again because he knew how. So I, sw I shifted my mindset to imagining I had already won. And sure enough, and I, and I, was, I was celebrating because I had, I just had a feeling. <laughs> I was dancing around the room before they called my number because I, 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 I had this feeling that I was gonna win. And sure enough, you know, my number was called. And so the, like, this would go on to the point where I had to step back because I felt bad that I was winning all of these fucking books and everyone was like, oh fuck, he's in the raffle? <laughs> they were like, fucking cash me out. I'm not, I don't want, I'm like, sorry, man. You got a chance. Everyone has a chance. It got to the point where I knew they were going to call my name and I was cringing in empathy with the other players. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I have to stop. You're like, this doesn't even feel good anymore. This is and step away from the raffle community on Instagram. <laughs> and they were like, legend. Um, but I filled up half this shelf with some of the most sought after books, playing in, playing in raffles with like, as, you know, in the beginning there was, a lot of them were, you know, hundreds of people. Um, and even 10, even when there's one in 10, you know, you're, those odds aren't great, you know, like, um, but I learned, and, and, I, and I would show my friends in this group chat a video that, that detailed the experiments of Rene, Rene Piache, um, mm. the, the French researcher, mm -hmm. and what he did with a with random movement generator and the baby chicks. Mm -hmm. and, I would, and I would try to tell them, remember, babe, remember the baby chicks. <laughs> because your, your intention, you know, and your emotions about, what they can affect a random movement generator, a random number generator. That's how these raffles were run with random number generators. You know, I'm also lucky at the roulette wheel often. Um, not always, but, but often. Um, and so I heard that you, and I know you're hesitant to talk about this, but I know that you, were, you guys were doing a little bit of experimentation with the roulette wheel and you had some pretty consistent results. Um, I'm wondering if you could give us a little sneak peek on the, on what was. Yeah, I've been fascinated by this. Okay. <clears throat> As an aside, I th uh, I think that there was at, at least one occasion where the people that create casino technology uh, came to visit the lab and was asking a, a lot of questions about oh, really? whether or not this stuff was real, because you know all of your slot machines are run by physical random number generators. Mm. It's, you know, that's, that's how they prove that it's, it's true random. So if, if you know, human consciousness and, and intention can have some sort of effect on, on these things, oh, then, I see. Um, there might be an unexpected bias in there. I think they would see that in the, in the gaming data, yeah. uh, but they were curious as to that anyway. Um, yeah, so the roulette experiment, um, I should... This was part of a, a whole like hour long talk. Yeah. But the idea was that I, I, I basically did this to to come up with some like a funny story for the, for for the for the talk <clears throat> that is interesting for people, mm -hmm. right? So it's like uh, you know everyone perks up when you say gambling. Yeah. So what I was exploring in that talk was the idea that can can we affect the past can we uh you know we know that we can influence a random number generator in the present moment can we do it in the past and there's there's some certainly some uh, experiments that suggest that one is a very simple case generate a bunch of random data in the past don't look at it right wait send your intention back into that data and then look at it and see if there's 
a statistically significant correlation. Okay, that's been done many times. Hmm. Um, and the results are about the same as when you're doing it in the present moment. So does that mean that something that is in a state of non-collapse, let's say, uncertainty, that hasn't been observed, is, is equally susceptible to something, an influence from the future? So maybe. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, when it, when it comes to the more mainstream question, um, there is such a thing as retrocausality in, in um, quantum experiments. So, for example, you can prepare two particles such that if you look at it, you, uh, you observe one that it instantly affects the outcome of the other. You can separate them through huge distances. And this is like Einstein's spooky action in distance, mm -hmm. right? So you have these like instantaneous correlation effects depending on how one is like observed uh, in, in two entangled particles. So there's a, there was a, a laboratory that um, created a time delay by sending one of those entangled particles to a detector short distance and another through miles and miles and miles of fiber optic cable to slow it down to light speed and then uh, made certain observations and found that there was a sort of backwards backwards in time quote unquote effect that was like retro causal so something from the point of view of the present was affecting like the the past in this part so there's there's some yeah. reason to think that this is possible okay now i'm making a stretch here into into the consciousness stuff but this is fun um <clears throat> so if that's the case, then how, like, what can you do with that? Yeah. And the, the idea I had was, well, a roulette table. So you would have, you'd have two teams. You'd have one team running a random number generator. And based on the outcome of that, if it was um, more ones, then you'd bet black. Mm -hmm. If it was more reds, then you'd bet red. And then you had somebody at the table and they're placing bets. And they're sending their intention um, backwards in time to the um, to the random number generator to affect it after they've seen the outcome. Oh. So you're creating a time loop. I see. So the person at the RNG sends a message to the better. They place the bet, and whatever that is, they send their intention backwards in time to the random number generator in the attempts to influence it to what it was, to the correct result, which right. then would give them the result, which then would have them place it. So it's this like, this causal time loop. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so they see, they see the result on the table. They send it back to, and then it gets sent back to them. Is it in time for the next spin or in time for for it was that spin it was for the same spin yeah so we're, we're, we're kind of bypassing and simultaneously you know um downloading the information so that it's there beforehand that's fascinating it's fascinating i mean and i, well, I almost said technically it should work <laughs> but i mean it depends on what technical you know venue you're talking about if SARS quantum physics goes I, I could see where this would live in that but you know everyone else is going to say you're fucking crazy this is never going to work but um makes sense with what I know and with the experiments that I've read like with prayer affecting people in the past um and all that so so how are your results okay so because you were dealing with because you're dealing with effects that could be forward and backward in time, if we're making a podcast and this is going to be a video that people are going to watch, if I say that it was successful, <laughs> then that might have, well, that could have, that could have two different effects, right? If I say it's successful, then everyone could believe that it was successful, which maybe has a positive effect the and, years, the years and, ago than I did it. Right. Right. But if, um, there's a lot of people that watch your show. So if I say that it's successful, then that could be like a little too much. Yeah. Because now somebody is saying that you can use, 
you know, uh, sigh to right. you know, win the lottery. So I'm not the first person that's said or done that, by the way. Um, and so that would be bad uh, because you might be pushing it too far and that would create a, like a, a counter moving effect right. on the machine. Now, if I say that it didn't happen, that it was a failure, then everyone, same problem, everyone would believe that it was a failure and it didn't work and have that effect retro, retro causally. Right. On them. But if I say it was a failure, then they, particularly your audience, are gonna be like, I see what he's doing. He's saying, no, it, it actually worked, but he's not gonna say that it worked. Um, and so they're gonna say, oh, I think it did actually work. Right. And um, <laughs> that might have its own set of complications. Right. The point is that <clears throat> I've never told anyone the outcome of this for those reasons. Right. Right. The point wasn't whether or not you could do it. The point was to communicate the deeper principles here, which are that from the from a consciousness point of view, the only thing that's totally real might be the present moment. Mm -hmm. The future is something that we imagine, but we've never actually seen it. And the past is a memory, which is actually a lot like the future. So I think that the present moment and the past might exist in something like a probability function of the present. And so, uh, you know, that's a far out idea. Yeah. Um, but all you really need for any reality is consistent histories and probable futures, right? So consistent histories and probable futures means that the, from the, the, the quote unquote past might be changeable to line up with the present. And the future might not be what you expect, but it probably won't be too different than what you expect. And when you're, when you're looking at an isolated consciousness effect on purely unpredictable, unobserved data, where do you draw the line as to where the influence is? Is it just the guy at the table yeah. affecting the machine? Or is it the millions of people who hear about this, you know, this crazy test right um, and that's really the way to look at it and that's that's the uh, that's the lesson there right now there's there's um, plenty of other people who have used like remote viewing yeah uh, there's some people I, I know one guy who was like professional at this for I don't know, maybe five years and he was uh, remote viewing the future to get um, stock price information and he was, <laughs> he was betting yeah and he did a little bit better than chance yeah yeah which is you, know, you could say, oh, well, so does anyone who puts money in the S&P over seven years, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not exactly you, what he was doing, but right. he did a little bit better than chance. Um, and, you know, he was, he was professional at it. Right. And, and there's others that have much better stories about how they were, how we're betting on these things. Yeah. And I was just listening to a remote viewer say that quietly, the bulk of his clientele when he left the military were corporations and stocks and using his abilities. He was like, but I'm not allowed to talk about that, so I don't like that. <laughs> but it's fascinating that he said that, and that, that that quietly, some of these, he's like, some of them are huge. And I was like, oh, I bet they are. Yeah. Because they got nothing to lose. Sure. You know, and uh, it's an easy bet to make for them, because they don't, you know, they're not concerned about, well, if it doesn't pay off. Well, you could say corporations, but it's, it's um, maybe in his case, it was actually yeah. corporations. Uh, I think, but there's there's individuals in high levels at companies. Oh yeah, who will um, consult astrologers or consult a, their own intuitive um, to help them make decisions. Yeah, um, certainly it helps. I can tell you if if the psychic person tells you, oh yes, this is this is the right decision, and that's the one you wanted to make. Yeah, you're like, oh, oh yes, yeah. that's definitely right. Or if the stars align for like the thing that you want. I kind of do that too, where I'll look at, um, you know, I'll, I'll like uh, sometimes like people offer to give me tarot readings. Yeah. And I'll ask a question. And if it's like the answer I want, I'm like, I, d yeah. I double down on it. But if it's not really, it's like an inconvenient or not the answer yeah, I I'm like, want. Yeah, like, like, this guy's a fraud. Well, <laughs> it's not a fraud, but it's like, yeah, I think, help, help me come to a different interpretation right, of this. Right, right. This is a bit inconvenient. Yeah. <laughs> That's just human, human nature. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I'm 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 not familiar with tarot. The way, the, but but I'm fascinated by it, and, and my brother's been getting into it. He's like, 
let me flip you a card. I'm like, I don't flip me a card all day, dude. Like, let's play poker or something. I don't know. Have I, you ever <laughs> looked at Oracle cards? Not really. Yeah, so I, I don't know that much about tarot either, um, but Oracle cards are really cool. So there are these decks that people make that have these images on them that are meant to be archetypes of some compound of the human psyche. Hmm. So you shuffle them up and then you pick a card and that card is uh, correlated to the question that you had. And then there's a book that goes along with it and you can read uh, hmm. the message from that card. Oh, cool. And some of them are just really, really well done, like like beautiful visually. Yeah. And, um, uh, there's one that I like called Sacred Rebels. Oh, cool. I like the sound of that. Yeah. There's a few people who, who do this. Um, you know, they, they put years of work into into these decks. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a deck. Oh, awesome. That'd be great. Um, speaking of Sacred Rebels. So I got you a, a, a blue goldstone uh, present for coming all this way. Oh, hey. And, uh, you know, that it's, it's, it's just associated with the crown chakra and the heart chakra. And I thought it. It was a great little representation and a gift for you. Thank you. Since you are always working on expanding our human knowledge in a conscious way. I love this. I've actually been uh, I've been eyeing it. Oh, really? The whole conversation. Awesome. Yeah, because it kind of dazzles in the yeah in the light. It's really cool. Thanks, man. You're very welcome. Appreciate it. Um, I'm I'm so grateful that you that you came all this way. Um, and we talked about a lot, and um, you know, I'm just continually excited to see what what you're working on and what the future brings and i and i i know we'll meet again so um i've I, i'm so grateful for your time for you coming all this way i, I want to give you a chance to tell everyone where they can if they would like to keep up with you and follow you and your work um you know whatever whatever channels you can you can point out to them i'm sure they're going to want to follow you after listening to this conversation I'm, I'm trying to be better at social media yeah um but i do have a, a twitter that um, maybe once every year or two I'll post something, but I'm trying to be better. Um, <laughs> you can search my name, Adam M. Curry, or Adam's Lab on Twitter. Um, website is entangled.org. Um, that is a mobile app designed to explore uh, global consciousness effects. Um, I started it, at, I started the basic research for that almost 10 years ago. Mm and then have been trying to, it's a very, really complicated thing to build and I'm trying to figure out how to do it. But I think I've got, uh, I think I've got it now. I've got a working version on my phone. This is gonna be a mobile app that y'all can download and oh, cool. and actually explore firsthand some of the stuff that we're talking about. Yeah. It looks like this. Awesome. Yeah, I, I know that it's not, I was going to, we were trying to download it and, and I think there's a wait list or something. Um, yeah, I just put up a wait list. It's like, hey, if you're interested, yeah. like, it might be a while, but... Um, I got to... So me and my peeps, we all signed up for the wait list. But, okay. Um, but, you know, very, very interested in it. Um, it looks like actually... So I'm, this is measuring... Um, each, each user has a dedicated uh, random number generator stream. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of broken into to, um, hours. And so the, the last hour looks like it was pretty strong. No kidding. In our conversation. Yeah. Nice. That makes sense. That's cool. Um, um, and uh, apart from that, I occasionally do uh, talks at conferences. Mm -hmm. um, usually these days, I'm well. I, I'm always only talking about consciousness stuff, yeah. but I'm doing a lot of, uh, of AI as well. Um, I've been kind of focused a lot on on my on my software side on artificial intelligence for the last um, two years, something like that. Um, but I'm, I find myself being asked all the time now about uh, the big questions yeah. related to AI. And so I have maybe a um, contrarian opinion about Me too. AI and consciousness. <laughs> and so uh, I'm, I'm happy to share that. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I meant to ask you about it. You know, I, uh, I tend to be on the con contrarian side as well. I don't, I don't side with the doom sayers and the fear mongers. Um, but yeah, please. You would you would you before we uh, yeah. yeah 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 okay we'll do we'll do a bit on AI. So um, I think that the tendency is to overestimate AI and to underestimate consciousness. So you know um, I think we we overestimate AI and we AI and we underestimate consciousness. Here's what I mean by that. Um, 
most people don't know how AI actually works. And by AI, I'm talking about like ChatGPT. So it's very, very impressive. It's awesome stuff. And it's driven by what, what's called large language models. And large language models is just kind of a relatively new approach to um, predictions. So when you put in a number of words or a sequence of words, what it's essentially doing is it's predicting what word follows that. That's it. Yeah. How you train these things is you get really large data sets, you know, huge volumes of text from the internet, and then you feed it into a neural network and you use something called tensors. And it creates a very complicated probability set of, if given this, what's most likely to come next. Right. That's it. Yeah. It's, it's uh, below AI is LLMs and then you pull back the curtain and it's, um, it's neural networks. Yeah. And, and algorithm. It, and it, below that it's, it's just statistics and it's, it's awesome <clears throat> because it's a very efficient way of getting good results. But um, I think if people knew that, then they, they wouldn't be Stop so having conversations with chat GBT so often, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe, or they, they, they would have the right way to think about the risk of AI suddenly becoming sentient Yeah, and, um, deciding that you know, humans need to go. Now there's risks of AI, but the risks of AI, I think are over reliance on AI. Meaning if you think it's some sort of infallible supercomputer and you connect it to critical infrastructure, oops, yeah, that could go wrong south. Yeah. That, that could go south really quickly. Um, and then there's also this question of like, well, who owns it? And you know, like the whole fiasco right. with Google and Gemini, how they, <laughs> they tried to make it woke Brilliant. and it just like rewrote history in all these absurd ways. Yeah. That's, that's a problem. Um, yeah. And then, and then the other side is that we underestimate consciousness. So consciousness is actually a really big mystery. Like forget all the psi research, random number generator stuff that we talked about. Yeah. Just the, the fact that the human body or the brain has subjectivity, has, has a quality to it. Like a, there's an experience of what it's like to be me attendant to these neurons just firing away. How do you explain that? Yeah. And like, like we can't. In fact, we're no closer to that than we are, than we were like you know, yeah. 10, 20 years ago. We, we, Everyone thought that it was. You, you, you watch the you look at these Scientific American articles every every couple of years. It would come out and say, "Oh, we've identified the location of consciousness in the brain." Like, I don't think you understand yeah. what you're talking about. And so now we've done away with that. So nobody thinks that it's it's a location in the brain <laughs> right. anymore. But where we are is that because of the assumption that this is sort of like materialist reductionist assumption on the brain. It's assumed that um, if you just have enough neurons and enough connections, then consciousness suddenly emerges from this. And that's actually, it's a free miracle. Yeah. There, there, there's a huge uh, explanatory gap in there. Now, you can't expect the people who are developing AI, uh, who are computer scientists, to really, to really know that. It's domain specific knowledge. So they, um, earnestly assume that, well, it's a question of enough complexity and from that consciousness emerges. It's like, well, maybe, but we have no idea of explaining how that's possible. Mm. Um, and it, and it might not be that at all. So for those two reasons, we have th th those two reasons combine and I think can explain a lot of why people think that AI is at risk of, of becoming the terminator. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> um, there's, there's other reasons too. I think that the, here's a hot take. Uh, <laughs> the narrative of AI is super dangerous because it might wake up only benefits the big yeah. incumbents. Here's why. If you say this <laughs> is the most dangerous and existential threat to humanity, what are you supposed to do with that? Regulate it. Okay, so, mm -hmm. um, so you're going to convene a collection of, <clears throat> uh, you know, congressmen and, and senators oh, whose yeah. only expertise on the matter is uh, the fact that they're elected officials. Right. Which is funny because it's like, if we're supposed to, ins if the thing that we're trying to stop is unmitigated <laughs> power. Yeah. 
So you're giving control of that to somebody whose only expertise on it is their own will to power. Right. So that's a bit of a problem. Anyway, uh, but what, what they'll do is they'll go talk to the experts in the field and they'll say, hey, is this, uh, is this dangerous? And those experts are going to be from the big companies. Right. And they're going to say, um, well, they can't say no. Right. Because they're risk averse. They have to, they have to disclaim. Right. All that. So they're going to say yes. And so they're going to create regulation and that regulation is going to require who knows what it's going to be, but it's right. going to make it like all it's, it's always going to make it more difficult for the open source oh, yeah. community <clears throat> to do these things. And it's um, and then only the big. Company. So you're, you're going to ensconce this oligopoly yep. around what is potentially the most powerful tool um, that, that, that we and one of the most powerful tools that we have to kind of like um, get us through the yeah you know the situation that we're in in terms of the technological stagnation and depleting workforce and you know all these things right. reindustrializing like we're going to need this stuff to, right. to help us so that that kind of doesn't help um and it's a boondoggle um it's a boondoggle so yeah. i hope that um it's not like i have a solution to that but the best that I can think of my best solution to that and the only thing that I'm even remotely capable of doing is to try to um, to try to push on this point that we don't understand consciousness enough yeah. to make these claims about it just waking up and becoming something yeah. sentient. <clears throat> I am working on um, some more exotic things which is kind of related to updating a, a Turing test related to all the RNG stuff that we've talked about. Yeah. That's that's another thing we can discuss later or something. But. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to have another conversation okay. down, down the road about about that because, you know, there's also that we were discussing last night about the, the, the presentience of, of animals and humans and how that's been measured. But the question is, you know, what brings the effect about? Is it is it happening, in, like we talked about, is it happening in real time or is it being measured and if, is it being measured after and then affecting past results? It's, it's, I think our understanding of time is going to continue to change too as sure. um, we continue to, to develop technology that um, does things we never thought linear, you know, possible. So, um, but we've definitely given everyone a lot to think about. Um, and uh, it's been a blast, brother. It's been great. So I'm so glad that you came down, and we will have to uh, we'll do it again, and, and you know we'll, we'll 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 cover some new ground next time we do it. And I'm grateful for your time, and we'll uh, you know, we'll let you know when this is going to come out. And, and I look forward to talking to you again. I'm going to stay in touch, bro. Um, it's been awesome. Yeah, right on. This is fun, you, man. Um, everyone, listen. If you are not subscribed to the channel. Stop beating around the bush and hit the subscribe subscribe button and hit the alert notifications and also follow me on Instagram if you are not already and follow our channel's page on Instagram Far Out with Faust and mine is the one Faust Chicho and um, please if you've enjoyed this podcast drop a comment share the video if you're listening to it thank you so much for listening uh, drop us a review even a single word uh, with a couple stars goes a long way in helping us to uh, to spread the channel and getting the algorithms to give us a little bit of favor instead of suppression. That's the challenge these days for conversations that I like to have. Thank you guys so much for listening, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Adam.